Welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. I'm really excited today because we have like a multinational kind of approach to things. We are going to be chatting with Michael Wilkinson, product director of Torchbox Limited. Michael, welcome. Hey, Julia. Nice to be here. So from that brief introduction, if you didn't catch it, Michael is British. But the best part, where are you coming to us from? I am in Mexico City today. Awesome. 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 Well, we really love this opportunity to get different viewpoints about things going around the world in the nonprofit, in the NGO um, sector. And so you had the most interesting thing that you did, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But we're really going to address six key challenges that UK charities face. And this really came from some in-depth work that you've done. And so I can't wait to chat with you about this. Um, I'm flying solo today, but we have this amazing co-host panel. And I know that many of them wanted to be on this episode, but I was like, nope, I'm holding this one to myself so that I get all my questions answered first. So um, join us when when they're with uh with the nonprofit show because they're truly amazing another thing that's amazing is we have fabulous presenting sponsors they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader your part-time controller fundraisers friday and 180 management group okay to the man of the hour michael wilkinson okay tell me how you got this data and what you did to get these um, nonprofits to open up to you? Yeah, well, before the pandemic, I used to go to lots of networking events, conferences, you know, like, like we all did. Um, and then just, you know, being in the sort of wilderness and being sort of kind of very internally focused during the pandemic, we were all trying to sort of get through it, weren't we? I just felt as we were coming out the other end of it, I really wanted to reconnect with people and see what was going on in other charities and just see what the kind of common problems were that we were trying to solve. So I figured, like, why don't we try to meet people virtually? I had moved out of London, so it was it was more difficult for me to kind of get to see people in person. So I set myself a challenge of meeting 100 charity leaders for a virtual coffee, um, and uh, I have just done it. So it's been quite a ride. I love it. Now, between Mexico City and London, or Great Britain in general, that's a nine-hour time difference, right? Uh, it's seven hours. Yeah, it was quite a lot. Seven. Okay, <laughs> seven. So that's like a full day, basically. I mean, you're you're trying to juggle all this. Talk to me how you did that and continue to do your work at Torchbox. And let's start off with what Torchbox does. Yeah, so Torchbox is a UK digital agency, but we work with uh, charities right across the world, particularly in the United States and the UK. Um, and we were established like 24 years ago with the purpose of doing digital for social good. And it was one of the first of its kind in the UK. Uh, it's 100% employee owned as a company as well, which is, I think, super interesting because we're all co owners. Um, and we work exclusively with nonprofits, public sector, higher education, any kind of socially progressive organizations. And we do everything right from sort of digital marketing uh, through to designing and building websites and applications, a lot of human centered design approaches. And basically with the, with the idea of helping to grow your income, uh, recruit more volunteers, uh, develop digital services, that sort of thing. Right. I love it. Well, this is going to be a great conversation because I'm all up for seeing how other folks do things, what we can learn from, and then kind of seeing how, you know, people are grappling with different issues. So the first challenge you identified is that there's a mismatch between funding and project goals. Talk to us about that. And what does that look like? Yeah. So this, I think, is not a new problem. It's been yeah. something that's been kind of like a perennial problem ever since really we started to do more work digitally. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of charities get their funding from uh, sort of grants, trusts, foundations, mm -hmm. and these, these uh, sources of income just haven't sort of caught up with the needs of charities in the sort of modern digital era. 
So what that means in practice is that a lot of charities really struggle to get funding for new digital initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, I think partly because some of these funders don't understand it so much. They don't understand the, the sort of tangible outcomes that, that the projects could deliver in the same way that delivering a face-to-face -face service, it's kind of more, it's easier for them to wrap their heads around. And I think the other challenge as well is that there are a lot of back office costs that um, are crucial to delivering digital services, sort of thinking about the technology and the people and the resources. And quite often those are not fundable uh, by these uh, sources of income. And so 45% of charities in a recent UK survey said that they were really struggling to access this sort of digital funding. And then when you actually look at black-led charities, this problem is even more amplified as well. So that's been kind of a new issue that's been coming up this year. And certainly in the conversations I've had, people have really sort of said it's it's been quite hard to sort of get these exciting digital projects off the ground. Yeah. You know, Michael, it's such an interesting thing. I spent a couple of weeks in the UK uh, summer before last and, and had an opportunity to evaluate some fundraising things that were going on. And it's so interesting because I feel like in the US, um, the fear is that we, we move to the government last because it's going to be so uh, unstable. Like we're not going to be, we're not going to have a funding source that's stable, not the government itself, but the funding source versus uh, the, the concept that we need to go after that $10 donor, that $15 donor, we need to go after the individuals. And so it's a really interesting flip with how we communicate, how we strategize and how we look for funding. Um, because yeah, every 1.8 million nonprofits registered in the US they're all chasing the buck, right? They're all chasing the, the dollar. And so it's interesting to hear uh, this perspective from you because that's got to be absolutely brutal because if you're working on these, these long-term relationships for this funding and they go south, you must feel like you're, you're just never going to be able to open your doors, right? Right. This is the problem in the, in the past, we had it quite good and uh, government grants were flowing um, and they allowed us to fund lots of different services mm -hmm. and we now lean in, we now live in much leaner times right both yeah. in the us and the uk yeah. and as a result of that uh, you know government grants have been slashed left right and center um, and uh, charities have been forced to sort of look for other other sources of funding right. and, it can feel quite sort of powerless in the sense that like this is kind of out of your control but mm -hmm. i think the thing i've seen the the best examples i've seen are where charities really double down on trying to diversify their income streams mm -hmm. um the more they can do that it you know it protects you i think from this sort of greater level of uncertainty yeah it's so much healthier well let's go on to challenge number two dealing with financial downturn now this is really you know important because if you are a charity in in the united kingdom and you are looking to partner with government uh local or national and then you see these these financial shifts again another terrifying thing right how do they deal with this right yeah so obviously You've seen in the US uh, so much volatility because of interest rates, et cetera. Yeah. Same picture in the UK. Uh, the last year or so has been so, so bumpy. And the, one of the ways in which, unfortunately, charities have had to deal with this is by pausing or stopping entirely different um, projects that they'd hoped to get off the ground in the last year. So we saw a sort of flatlining in the past 12 months. Um, and we certainly saw that at Torchbox where, you know, charities weren't able to get the projects off the ground that they wanted to. Mm -hmm. I do say, though, I feel quite optimistic. Okay. I know in the last 24 hours we've had some craziness with the stock markets, etc. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like a sense of um, some green shoots now, you know, interest rates are sort of calming down. Uh, we've certainly seen an uptick in charities wanting to do more, more things again, which is nice to see. And in some recent um, surveys as well, there's a big survey of UK charities recently uh, that 
that showed that 75% of the public had said they donated to a nonprofit in the last three months. So I feel like that gives me a kind of cause for optimism. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I think that's really cool. And I think that, you know, um, organizations that have more success with that and connecting with those donors um, and, and expanding their liability, if you will, from, you know, just having that one funding source, which can be so frightening, um, that's just going to breed more success, right? Because other organizations will take a look at that and, and learn from it. So very, very interesting. Well, let's go on to number three, struggle to keeping up with tech changes. My friend, this is a global issue. I, I got to believe that if, if you start your next thing and that's a hundred T's with a hundred American organizations, this is going to come up, right? Totally. This was a big conversation starter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the very thin edge of this, you've got things like AI, right? Mm -hmm. It's like strap your seatbelts on because this thing is going so darn fast. Yeah. Um, it's quite hard to um, sort of keep keep hold of that agenda for for nonprofits. They they have fewer resources. Um, we don't necessarily have the leadership that fully understands this emerging technology. And, you know, it, it's just been such a big topic of the conversations I've had, certainly in the reports that are coming out as well. There is just um, real evidence to show that a lot of charities have not got a proper strategy in place with this. It's been sort of let loose with employees sort of dabbling with it themselves, but actually yeah. charities haven't really engaged with AI. And that's AI, right? But we're not getting the basics right. So there's like a whole other layer of technology and just the general shift in human behaviors with technology that mm -hmm. uh, charities need to keep up with. And I think like we need to get those things right whilst at the same time trying to hang on the coattails of, of AI as well. So it's a huge challenge, this one. You know what? I love that you said this, and I haven't heard anyone actually draw that line across. I think you're very, very spot on. You know, um, in the U.S., there was virtually a, a handful of nonprofits, and they were like big institutions that really had started to embrace um, you know, digital fundraising prior to the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, I think nonprofits were forced to really move into a more of a digital framework, uh, but they hadn't budgeted for it. They hadn't planned for it. I loved what you said. They didn't have the intellectual or even, dare I say, the spiritual leadership, you know, that says, come on, we're going to do this. Um, and it's just kind of been sloughed off. So this, this was really a cool thing for you to point out that, we need to get it right at the base so that then we can uh, move up. Well, yeah. one in four UK charities don't engage with digital fundraising at all. Okay, so we're not even doing that. You know, AI feels quite a leap, doesn't it? So, right. and you're thinking about digital strategies as well, right? So the tech is one thing, but it's what you do with it, right? And how you bring people with you. Um, only half of UK charities say they have any kind of digital strategy. And I think it's something like, I think it was off the top of my head, like 14% of them say that they actually feel like that's embedded in the organization. Mm -hmm. So there's a real disconnect between like what we think we should be doing and what we're actually doing. Right. That is a fascinating thing to think that you've only got, you know, 25% engaged. And then within that 25%, 14% feels confident in navigating it forward. Um, it would be so it will be so fascinating to see if you can determine over the course of time that 25 percent 14 percent how further how much further they are on the journey like what has been you know the result of that investment and even just understanding it right just buying into it yeah um, I, I would say like i i was a digital leader in charities for seven years and sometimes it can feel like you're as a lone free ranger. And, and, and the thing that came out of the virtual coffees was when I spoke to people who were in my shoes, um, you know, they, they were really struggling to get that kind of buy in from the wider leadership. Yeah. Um, there is an appetite for it amongst the employees, but it's yeah, it's how do you sort of take everybody with you? 
Um, right. that's, that's been a real challenge, not only for myself in my career, but for the people I spoke to on the virtual coffees. Wow, fascinating stuff. Well, let's go to um, challenge four. And I want to spend a little bit more time with this because I would love for you to explain how it's different in the United Kingdom and in, in Europe in, in general when it comes to the ownership and the management and the security of data and, and personal information. My personal opinion is that what you all have done there is, is moving across to us and it will be a hell of a shock to most American nonprofits because they'll be like, what? We can't do this? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, as you said at the, at the top of the show, I am based in Mexico City, but obviously I'm British. Um, the, the parallel, like the sort of differences are unbelievable, right? And I think um, maybe the US is very similar to the Me Mexico in the sense of yes. it's a little bit of a free for all. Oh, um, yeah. I've, I've got I've got two phones, a UK one and a Mexican one. And the Mexican one, I dare not pick up the phone because you are being hounded constantly. There are no restrictions whatsoever. They find ways of getting hold of you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, in the UK, when sometimes I get one of those kind of rogue cold calls, I'm like, how dare you? Like, how did you get my number? I feel quite affronted. And so that's the sort of difference in the mentality. You know, I think we, we, we really don't like that, um, you know, the misuse of our data in, in that way. Um, and so that's because we've just got such strong privacy laws compared to the states. So that's always a huge consideration for charities about how you can use the data in a, in a responsible way. Well, Michael, it's got to make it even more fearful or uh for a nonprofit, a charity in, in the united kingdom to say we're not even going to invest in this type of technology because we can't get to the people we need to get to right i mean it's got to seem like you're you're working with such a small number is that true or is that not true no i don't believe that to be true i i think there's i think there's some like sort of fear i guess around how to use data and certainly um the conversations i'm having with charity leaders is that this is a big area of focus this year um but people do worry about uh what are the best ways not only to collect the data but how to use it and you know again unfortunately similar to technology there are low um skills in this area in terms of yes. using the data and the data is only as good as what you do with it right so I think there are, there's a renewed focus on how can we, you know, engage new people, new audiences, but then what do we do with that? And that's certainly like some of the projects I've been focused on lately have been very much about that. And if, if I may just give one example to bring it to life. I've re recently been working with um, a, a charity that provides assistance dogs um, to, to, to help people with disabilities. And they, their data was like all over the shop. They were collecting lots of data, but didn't really know like which parts were important. Mm -hmm. The data hadn't been cleaned up. And as a result, they weren't bringing in enough volunteers to take on these assistance dogs to, you know, when they become puppies, you know, to train them up. So it created a whole situation for their volunteering. And by cleaning the data, thinking about what's really, really important um, and just getting much better sight of it and then making some uh, changes to the user experience, we have absolutely blown up the volunteering. It's been amazing in just the last month to see how many people are now coming through the door. And the whole decision-making process is now data-driven. And that's so nice because now we can see, okay, next month we've got this number of people coming in. Okay, yes. we're seeing this problem area here. What can we do? Can we switch some more resources to this? And that's the beauty of data once you start to get it to work for you. Okay, so this is the curveball question. Does this organization and does your team think that you can convert some of these volunteers into donors? Well, I think you've got to you've got to think about volunteers maybe slightly differently. Yeah. Um, in that uh, the time that they give uh, is you know just as value, valuable, if not more valuable than than just they're just being like a regular donor for example i mean i'm sure there is definitely a sort of intersection right yeah. but i think um 
what I'm seeing with a lot of charities in the UK is that volunteering is becoming increasingly a central pillar to their activities. Yeah. Kind of going back to what we were saying earlier about government grants being slashed, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. We've now got to rely increasingly on volunteers to be the yep. sort of backbone of charities. I mean, they always have been, but I think it's becoming ever more important. And so it's about recognizing that value that they, they, they can provide. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is a big conversation here. I mean, there are a lot of organizations that feel like you should never, ever, ever ask a volunteer to become a donor because they're donating their time, talent and treasure of, of some degree. Um, and to value that. But then there are others that are like, these these can be your best champions because they're boots on the ground and they can see what you need and how you work and, and how you steward. So this is a, a fascinating question. It really, really is that has yet to be answered fully. Uh, Definitely. You know. So but all, not all volunteer, they're made equal, right? You, you also have young people, the sort of Gen Zs, that have um, time and they want to give it to something that they really feel passionate about and that they believe in, but they are cash poor. You know, they, they can't give regularly in the same way that the older donors can. And yeah. so, you know, you've got to really think about people as individuals and, yeah, not everybody is in the same situation. And But how can we best utilize, you know, what that person might have to offer? Right, right. And, I, you know, to this challenge, it goes back to data. I mean, the better you've tracked who these folks are and what they're doing for you and how they feel about your organization, I think you can be a much better steward of that relationship, right? Um, so very, very interesting. Well, let's go to number five, using human-centered design approaches. Now, this is a big torch box value and pillar that you all work with. Talk to us about this. Yeah, so I actually think this is probably where we start to see the biggest distinctions between the US and the UK. Um, I think certainly when I talk to people that are not from the UK, there is a sort of slight admiration, I guess, for sort of British design principles um, and the fact that we are so human centered um, in our work. So I think that's something that's, um, that's you know, it's quite British. And I, and I, I think uh, it's a very important part of what we do at Torchbox. When I approach, um, you know, potential charity clients, um, often you don't sort of see the light switching on upstairs in terms of like the value of doing that user research and connecting with people to find out like what are the problems we're trying to solve. But when you do do it and you do manage to persuade people to invest a little bit in researching with people and designing around their needs, wow, then the magic happens because it, it just delivers results in a way that um, people don't expect. You, you're able to solve like the problems at the, at the sort of crux of it. And I think that's the beauty of human-centered design. And so it's a really big part of what we try to do at Torchbox um, throughout most of our projects. Right, I, I think it, it's um, for so many organizations here, it's just kind of, it goes against that savior mentality, right? Like, I know what's best for you. And so if you just listen to me, I'm going to solve the problem versus communicating with the community and saying, what is the problem? What are the solutions? What are you looking for? Um, and we don't do that enough. It's a, it's a really, uh, to me, it's a critical thinking issue because when we have leadership and we have boards of directors that don't even begin to see that as a value, uh, that's a heavy lift, right? That's a heavy lift. I agree, Julia, and I, I think there's a couple of things here. So you, the, one fact is that most people who work in a charity actually rarely come into contact with the end user. And so I think that's an issue in that there's a sort of disconnect between the sort of back office and, and the people that you're there to help. And then I think the other thing in my reflection is when I first entered the nonprofit sector, my first role, I certainly got that sense of, um, you know, there are lots of people with lots of years of experience um, in nonprofits, and, and that's incredibly valued. They're subject experts totally. But there is a sort of culture of assumption based thinking, yes. you know, like I've got all these years of experience, so I know uh, and I can advocate for um, the people that we help. Um, and I think with human centered design thinking, that no longer really fits. Subject expertise is really important to inform, you know, 
when we start to ideate around like what solutions might help people. Um, but actually the, the real way to kind of get to this is by going straight to the horse's mouth and really finding out, you know, what are those problems that people are experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives um, and then crafting solutions around that. Absolutely. You, I, to me, this is like one of my biggest pet peeves about the sector is that we don't, uh, I, I call it dog fooding. I didn't create that, but you know, yeah. it's, we don't taste the dog's food, right? We don't know what's going on. And I love that you called this out because I think that is um, one of the things that is like one of the, the, the biggest uh, detriments to a nonprofit success in terms of achieving mission. Let's go on to number six, labor issues across the organization. Whew, big topic. <laughs> yeah, we could talk for hours just on this one. Um, now I know in the I read reports in the US that you know a lot of nonprofits have been struggling to fill a lot of roles. Um, I think in the UK, it's been interesting since the pandemic, we have been at the at the vanguard of flexible working. Um, but we're sort of diverging into sort of two paths. You've got the sort of um, charities that really em embrace flexible working. And the last charity that I worked for, um, Royal National Institute for Deaf People, uh, decided to go fully remote, digital first for most of its employees. And as a hiring manager, that was amazing for me because, you know, we were being flooded with applications because candidates now expect a whole lot more. You then got uh, other charities who are trying to come back to more traditional ways of working. And I think they will inevitably encounter problems in, you know, in a market where candidates expect a whole lot more. I think the other challenge that charities are facing is that there's more competition now. So traditionally, you know, people would want to work for a charity and they would never sort of look twice at maybe move, moving into a commercial environment. But now what we're seeing, and I certainly found this in my recruitment challenges, is that a lot of companies now are much more socially progressive, yeah. uh, they have a, a stronger agenda there, and actually it's become much more attractive for those charity-minded people to want to work in those right. uh, those companies. So there's lots of positives, but charities need to be leaning into them. And this was probably the number one topic of the virtual coffees. Because we'd gone fully remote, everybody wanted to ask me questions about that and, yeah. and to find out kind of what happened next. Wow. Well, I think it is a, a big question. What is going to happen next? And uh, I agree with you. I think it's one of those things that um, is such a huge topic because there's so many new things going on. And I agree with you. We haven't been talking about this enough. But I think the for-profit sector figuring out that when there is some sort of philanthropic connector, it increases job satisfaction and it makes people feel like, you know, they're not just making money for the man, but they're they're adding something to society into civil society. Right. So I think this is a very, very interesting thing to be watching for. I mean, I'm having this conversation with a man from who lives and works from Mexico City for a British company. And I'm, I host an American based show, right? So it's the perfect example of this confluence. Yeah, it's just, and that's beautiful. You know, we're, we're connecting with people that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to connect with. Yeah. And I think that's really special. You know, we do most of our work remotely with our clients. I have a number of clients based in the US. And, uh, you know, it's great. I love that. I absolutely love that. I think, I think the other thing I would say that this is more on the charity leaders is skills in the labor market as well. There's a real need to focus on digital skills. Um, and this becomes a, an increasing problem every year because tech is moving on so fast. And I think there's also a divergence between large charities and smaller charities and the smaller charities really struggling to keep up pace. So I think that's the other sort of the other argument on this one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been amazing. I mean, I, I warned you our time was going to fly by and it has. I have so many more questions to ask you. You really made me think about a lot of new and different things. And uh, so we do need to get you back on Michael Wilkinson, product director of Torchbox. Check out torchbox.com. They have a lot of thought leadership articles and pieces that will really give you some ideas about 
what they're looking at. I think especially when and if you are a nonprofit that's looking to work with donors in a different part, not even just of your own state, but maybe your region or globally, uh, it's such a fascinating thing to, to delve into, to see you know, with how the minds of a culture works when it comes to uh, charitable efforts. And so fascinating conversation. Now, Michael, we need to invite you to have a virtual tea with American leaders, right? Exactly. I've done my 100 uh, cups of coffee. That's a lot of coffee for one person. So I would now like 100 virtual cups of tea stateside. So do hit me up on LinkedIn and uh, let's have a cup of tea. I love it. Well, we need to help you with that because, you know, it's such a fascinating industry here. 1.8 million nonprofits registered in the U.S. And they're all doing a lot of different things differently, I should say. So um, most definitely check out Michael. As he said, you can connect with him on LinkedIn and also visit torchbox.com. Again, we want to thank our presenting sponsors. Without them, we would not have been able to chat with Michael and have this riveting conversation, which I hope we will have again with him. And those sponsors include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. They're here with us day in and day out so that we can have these amazing conversations. Michael, fascinating. You really gave me some new things to think about. And um, I really hope that we can stay connected and, and have you back on. Absolutely. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, we sign off each episode of the Nonprofit Show with this message. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks. Everybody.